Hello, my name is Jeffrey Nicholas. I'm an associate professor of philosophy at Providence College. This is the third in a series of lectures on McIntyre's Dependent Rational Animals. In this lecture, I will be covering chapters two and three. This will be the only lecture in which I cover two chapters together. However, the uh, chapters two and three flow together so smoothly that I thought it was important to capture both uh, within the same lecture. And so in these two uh, chapters, what we're doing is we're looking specifically at comparisons between the non-human animal world and the human animal world, and then we're doing a deep dive into the dolphin world, no pun intended, of course, uh, to uh, examine more closely our relationship to uh, one of the most intelligent uh, non-animal species uh, that we are uh, that we know about. Uh, and so, if you remember, there are three. A theses that McIntyre is going to try to defend throughout this book. One is our relationship to uh, non-human animals and what that means for our intelligence. One is about the relationship between uh, uh, dependent, uh, acknowledged dependent virtues and our independent rationality. And then the third is with the nation state. So we are within that first thesis thinking about the relationship between the non-human animal world and the human animal world and what we can learn about ourselves uh, by thinking about those comparisons. So some common mistakes uh, within philosophy and also within the uh, world at large, uh, and particularly within theological discussions, is to draw sharp lines uh, between uh, the human being and the non-human animal world, oftentimes to even ignore that human beings are animals, that we have bodies, uh, that we are vulnerable, uh, that we are subject to disease, that we are dependent upon each other. And uh, many times this comes down to arguing about whether animals uh, do or do not possess language. And so the argument usually goes animals don't possess language or dolphins don't possess language or et cetera, et cetera. And so they lack some kind of power or capacity that human beings do. Uh, and so some of those powers or capacities include speech or rationality or simply mind itself. Uh, Descartes, for instance, one of the more, uh, more famous philosophers of modernity uh, says that uh, other animals do not have mind. They're simply automatons. Uh, what we would call robots, uh, and they simply uh, don't have any kind of, of, of uh, mental capacity that uh, human beings do have. So certainly what we will see challenged in this discussion are those kinds of uh, belief systems and an attempt to think about what, is it, what does it mean to say that non-human animals do not have language and what does it mean to say that human animals do have language. And often what we see in these discussions among philosophers are comparisons with certain kinds of animals, but typically those comparisons are with the uh, less intelligent animal species. Uh, so they might be comparison with worms or with lizards, uh, and very rarely comparisons uh, with mammal species like cats and dogs, uh, or uh, even more rare, a comparison with species uh, like uh, gorillas, and other apes or uh, with dolphins and whales. And so what McIntyre is going to push back on in the discussions that you will read in his book are the kinds of comparisons that philosophers have made with the non-human animal world and then to bring into discussion comparisons that have not been made, uh, particularly with dolphins, which we will look at in just a moment. And so when we start thinking about what it means to be uh, human, uh, we can look at what it means to talk about uh, understanding each other. And so there's what we call interpretive knowledge. How do we know when someone is doing something? So uh, if you walk across someone uh, on the street and they are uh, you know, singing and dancing, how do you interpret what they are doing? Are they doing something to sort of uh, be an entertainment uh, in a in a Fourth uh, of July parade? Are they uh, crazy and don't have a concept of reality around them, or are they simply uh, begging on the street or doing something to kind of raise money? These are all possibilities, and uh, we need some kind of interpretive uh, involvement knowledge there. 
And McIntyre says that what that involves is a responsive sympathy to the person. So we have to understand the context and how we are supposed to be sympathetic to that person uh, who is singing and dancing on the street. And that also involves empathy, being able to put myself in their place, which means being able to understand the kinds of reasons that they have. Now, for Descartes, we can not really do that except to think about ourselves doing those sorts of things. And that's why he says that non-human animals simply uh, have behavior and they do not have mind. But when we think, start to think about what children are doing, right? Children don't, aren't born with an ability to be sympathetic to other or to understand what others are going to, to be empathetic and to understand their reasonings. And what we do through education is invite the pre-linguistic child into a series of responses and stimuli for understanding it. Now, it's not easy to see this when we think about uh, learning language because we're not always aware that what we're doing in teaching language is teaching a set of, of responses to words. But if we think about teaching a child sign language, certainly what we're doing there is teaching that child certain kinds of responses in certain kinds of situations. Uh, now, if you've raised children, you probably are familiar with certain kinds of experience with a child and teaching a child to uh, talk. I remember, um, you know, walking uh, to and from uh, the laundry uh, area in my apartment building with my children and my children looking at this other woman and saying, what is, what, what is mommy doing there? What is that mommy doing? And not, uh, and so understanding that other woman as a mom, and so there's a certain kind of response that's that's required there, and how do we engage in those interpretations and responses? And so we do this not only with our children, but also with other uh, non-human animals. And so it's only because we participate in some range of responses and recognitions, social responses and social recognitions, that we are able to identify what others are thinking and feeling. And so part of what McIntyre will talk about is training dogs, right? And so what we're, we're doing is we're engaged in a social experience with uh, a dog to learn to recognize and to respond in certain ways to what we're doing. And so here uh, we see the dog uh, shaking hands with uh, presumably its owner, but we don't know, uh, just someone on the street there, All right? And so we need to think the same way. How do we teach a child when to shake a stranger's hand and when to back away from the stranger, right? So these are uh, social responses that are often pre-linguistic, right? A child cannot often say why, why uh, the child reaches out a hand or why the child does not reach out a hand uh, when learning to interact with strangers. So what philosophy does here is to help us to come up with concepts to understand the practices that we're involved in. And so uh, often philosophers are mistaken uh, when they try to speak about what is happening. And so what McIntyre is going to try to do here is, is look to the experts, and particularly the expert, experts about dolphin behavior, to understand how we relate, how we as human animals relate to the non-human animal world. And so it's it's interesting to do that uh, with dolphins because there are so many extensive studies of dolphins. Uh, and you can find some of these uh, on YouTube or in other uh, areas where you can watch videos about dolphin training. Uh, but we also net, uh, know that dolphins have a similar uh, brain mass to body ratio as do human animals. Uh, dolphins live socially as do human animals. Uh, dolphins have vocal learning uh, that uh, might surprise many of us. Uh, dolphins exhibit similar affections and passions as human beings. Uh, dolphins are one of the, the few animals that play purposefully uh, and not just uh, 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 engaging in play. And also they're one of the few animals that interact uh, with human beings and particularly that initiate uh, that interaction with human beings. And so you can see that in a variety of ways um, by looking at some of these dolphin studies, uh, but also through your own experience uh, with other animal species, intelligent animal species. Now, the other reason that we want to look at dolphins is because we can talk about dolphins flourishing, right? And so flourishing involves, and flourishing is going to be the background for much of our discussion throughout this book, right? When we talk about 
human animals being independent practical reasoners, what we're talking about is human animals as flourishing. And so if we want to understand what it, our relationship is to non-human animals, we want to understand what those human animals uh, sorry, what those non-human animals are doing when they're flourishing. And so flourishing involves certain goals and strategies, right? So pursuing certain kinds of goods, right? And a good is simply what moves an agent to act, right? And so we might be mistaken about what those goods are. We might mistake what, what it is that we're pursuing, or we might be mistaken that that is our good. And that's something certainly true more of human animals than it is of non-human animal species. Uh, but the point here is that Animals have these goals that they're pursuing, and that provides the goods for them. And so we can think about the kinds of goals that dolphins have uh, when they are uh, when they are living their flourishing lives, right? And so certainly some of that is to eat, but also some of it is to play and to interact with others and to live socially. Okay, and so we want to think about the good and the flourishing of each animal with uh, as understood as a particular member of a particular species. So if we want to think about dolphins having reason or we want to ascribe reasons to all dolphins, we have to understand what kind of goods they're pursuing. And we will do the same thing with, with humans, right? If we want to understand why a human being is doing something, we want to think about what kind of goods that human being is uh, pursuing. So if we are to subscribe reasons for action to members of such species, uh, a set of reasons at the achievement of which the members of that species aim, a set of judgments about which actions are are or are likely to be effective in achieving those goods and a set of true counterfactual conditions that enable us to connect the goal directedness and the judgments about effectiveness. And we see that again through dolphin studies as well as through understanding uh, uh, human uh, children and how they come to learn to do certain things. So we know through many of these studies that uh, uh, dolphins have particular kinds of capacities, right? And so if you look particularly at the studies by uh, Louis Herman, who has done a lot and uh, with dolphins and understood dolphins, we can see uh, both their performance in the ocean and with human trainers, what kind of perceptual and communication skills that they have, right? And so their ability uh, through echolocation, uh, echolocution to understand uh, where things are, to uh, perceive that way, but also to communicate with each other and uh, with uh, the human species provides a certain kind of a set of capacities that are very similar to capacities that uh, human animals have. And so McIntyre wants to think about those capacities in thinking about what is the relationship between the non-human phronesis and the human phronesis. And so I, I talked before about how phronesis is this practical rationality that we have and that uh, non-human animals have it too. And so what we're going to look at uh, as we look at non-human animals is what kind of practical rationality they have and what we can find out about the, uh, the human rationality. And so first we're going to look at what are the features of human languages that we might say animals don't have. And then we're going to look at the arguments that philosophers have made that move from premises about language to conclusions about the inabilities of non-human animals. And then we're going to bring those into question so that we can characterize intelligent activity uh, of dolphins and uh, non-human animals and think about what that might mean for human capacities for reasons. So there's three steps to this argument. These three steps are going to take place over the next two chapters. Uh, and we're going to look at language uh, in relationship to non-human animal and how that has been used uh, against the non-human animals. But what we might have left out or what philosophers have left out in that discussion that mischaracterizes the human animal. Thank you.